I call to order the Waverly City Council for February 23rd, 2015. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as distributed by our city clerk? Move approval of the agenda. Is there a second? Second. Motion second, council discussion. All in favor signify with yes. 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 Those with no comes our agenda. We welcome Jeff Mick, who uh, is with us for the third time. Mm -hmm. Third and final. Third and final. <laughs> Any uh, words of wisdom you'd like to offer before we begin? Just uh, learning a lot here and enjoying it. So unless you participate, it's hard to realize what goes on just reading the newspaper. So it's been fun. That's good. Um, there is a lot of background and there is a lot of prep. And uh, thank you for acknowledging that. The first item on our study session calendar for this evening is the uh, progress report on Champions Ridge. And we're very privileged to have Mr. Fred Ribich with us this evening. And we'll just turn the mic over to uh, Fred. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. As uh, Mayor Infeld mentioned, my name is Fred Ribich. I chair what uh, we call the Fair Diamond Development Committee. Um, <clears throat> and it's been a little while since we've been before council to bring you up to speed on what all has been happening with the project. And so I think at each of your places there's a, a, an outline of what we would like to um, uh, get through this evening by way of review of the project. And uh, before I introduce our consultant that's been working with us, I just want to mention a couple things by way of general overview about the project. Um, in the process of talking to many folks uh, about Champions Ridge, particularly prospective donors, um, we got a lot of feedback that uh, folks would like would be more excited about this project if they could see some activity taking place out on the site. And so one of the things that we realized is that we needed to get more detailed information about what it would take to start prepping the Champions Ridge site to receive uh, the ball diamonds and uh, for the fair to begin thinking about putting buildings on the project because we knew that there was a fair amount of earthwork that was going to have to take place out there to get the first phase of the project in shape. We started out by going back to Structure Architects, uh, which was the firm that did the conceptual layout for Champions Ridge. They did some very preliminary work on, on design and, and some cost estimates, but it wasn't in enough detail to be able to uh, put a very fine pencil to figuring out uh, what is it that has to be done and if we were to get to a point where we would want to uh, bid this project or hire a contractor, we would need those, those specs. Uh, Structure Architects had worked with Confluence uh, out of Des Moines. They are now out of Des Moines and Cedar Rapids uh, on part of that design and layout and so we went back to Confluence and we in late October of 2014 entered into a contract with Confluence to bring the project to a point where we would have uh, essentially bidding documents and a, a much uh, finer understanding of what the uh, basic infrastructure and earthwork would uh, likely cost. As we were doing that, uh, <clears throat> a couple of other things in the background I just wanted to remind you of uh, that have happened in the recent past. 
uh, the Fair Association and the city entered into a purchase contract for the 40 acres of land that um, the fair will eventually occupy. Uh, they've made an initial payment on their first installment, and I think they've maybe made a partial payment on uh, the second installment. It's a five-year purchase contract. Um, and so that's moving forward. And organizationally, the ball groups decided that it was in their interest to uh, develop a structure that was under one umbrella rather than three. Uh, we started out with um, three different ball organizations, the Adult uh, Softball Association, the uh, Waverly Boys Little League, and the Waverly Girls Softball Group. Uh, those have now been merged under um, an umbrella organization. The adult softball folks are an approved 5013C uh, organization, and so they are organizing under that um, uh, name, uh, but they have one board uh, and a set of representatives that can speak for the ball groups, which uh, helps considerably. Uh, the other thing that I would mention, and one of the reasons that we um, entered into the contract with Confluence, is that we wanted to move um, as expeditiously as we could to uh, initiate some activity at the Champions Ridge site. Um, and as we looked at the first phase of the project, the most obvious sort of way to get something happening out there sooner rather than later was to focus on developing that first quad of ball diamonds. And so we've sort of been featuring that in some of our conversations with prospective donors um, and uh, working to try and get that um, activity going out there, both in terms of the earthwork that's necessary and eventually operational ball diamonds um, just as quickly as we can, probably preceding uh, the time when the fair would actually uh, be able to host a fair on site. In working with Confluence, <clears throat> we talked a lot about whether we should focus only on doing the earthwork that would allow us to put the diamonds in and, and get an entrance into the Champions Ridge site or whether we should do the whole thing in terms of prepare the fair land as well for uh, occupation. And in the end, we decided that we would undertake the, the full phase one uh, work. Uh, there were some cost efficiencies that would be achieved that way. There were some uh, issues in terms of how dirt would need to be moved that would maybe make things a little more difficult if we only did just the ball diamonds. So when we uh, try to uh, map out for you the work that Confluence has done for phase one, uh, it's the ball diamond and the fair land in its entirety. Uh, and that in essence what we're trying to do is get to a point where the site is ready for above ground work. So uh, I'm going to introduce Ben uh, Sandell from Confluence, who's been our project manager on, on uh, the site work. We'll uh, sort of step you through that, um, and then we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit about what lies ahead and where we're at on some fundraising issues and, and uh, answer questions that folks may have. So Ben? Hello, I'm Ben Sandell with Confluence. I want to thank Fred for the project background and thank you guys for the opportunity to describe the project. Uh, we feel it's a great project, so we'll just jump into the design, the meat and bones of the design here. And uh, it's a brief, brief agenda for the meeting. Um, we'll talk about the access, the circulation, and some of the features figured in phase one, as well as uh, some of the master plan updates that we've gone through in this process in the last few months. This is the master plan that was created a couple of years ago. Um, through the work with structure and the committee. Um, as you can see, there's uh, three quads, three diamonds, quads, and then this is the fairground up here, and then we have campgrounds that are associated with the fair, 
and then the uh, possibility of a DNR research facility up here. So this is where we started off kind of this process back in October is looking at the master plan, figuring out what we could get done, as Fred said, to make the land workable in the immediate future. Um, this was kind of a middle of the road phase. Uh, a few months ago, we started redefining, um, refining really the design um, and getting into greater details and working with the fair folks to figure out what configurations of barns, because in the, in the in end scheme of everything here, we wanted to make sure that the full design build out worked so that when we pare it down for this phase one, we can expand and continue on with some of the infrastructure and grading properties <coughs> to really not have to redo anything when we come back in later. So this is kind of the, the current master plan of the entire phase one site, um, including the fairgrounds and the, and the first quad of diamonds, as Fred mentioned. And then I'll go into some more detail here of the master plan. So we have our uh, phase one access off of Highway 3 is happening in this area. This is a DOT approved alignment. Um, this road line alignment will actually become a future arterial road for the city of Waverly. Um, that alignment has been approved through the, through the review process. So um, we're all in, in concert there with, with everything that will happen in the future. Um, as Fred said, the first four quads is part of phase one. Um, um, future phases, there was an interest in providing an access, an alternative access, um, alternatively from Highway 3 um, off of this site, so we've included that shown in here. The, the, the loop road was updated from the master plan. It had to move over a little bit to accommodate for the future arterial road alignment. And then what's not shown in here is there's stormwater basins and swales along the entire site that really manages the stormwater in an effective manner um, rather than using a lot of piping. Some of the parking <coughs> aspects of this part of the, the master plan. Um, the closest lots to the diamonds are right here within the loop road and the diamonds, so easy access without crossing any roads. We have 85 stalls there. We also have uh, some reinforced and overflow lots located here and here. And then also par par part of this will be included in phase one, but then the rest of this will be opportunities for future expansion as the need comes. So what we're showing here is approximately 450 lot, uh, parking stalls um, that will service this building and then fair functions as well as softball tournaments, et cetera. So in this half of the site, really, we're looking at about 700 total stalls of parking. Um, flipping to the other side of where we're looking at the fairgrounds, we did go back and look at some uh, precedents. Um, we looked at the Iowa State Fair, Texas State Fair, Nebraska, Minnesota, ones that people may have used to, and we really found some interesting things there as far as where the ho horse barns are located in terms, in relation to the, the other livestock barns. So we kind of took those ideas and melded them into the <coughs> fairground um, area over here. So one of the requests was to make a, a prominent show barn arena, which is right here. It's, it's jutting out a little bit from these other livestock barns to really give it some prominence along this uh, main entry point. Um, we have parking kind of all around these barns, so it's a direct access to load your livestock in from a trailer, et cetera. There's parking located all around these buildings for, for whatever uses you have. Um, we have the beef barn and cattle barn with tie-out areas. Um, this is the horse arena with a warm-up area, and then this, obviously, they all kind of lead into the main show arena as needed. On the south side of the horse barn, we have small animal and livestock show, area, show arenas and areas. Um, this is the petting zoo, and then this is the 4-H and FFA, or FFA um, future building with an associated parking lot there as well. And so you can kind of see some of the parking stall breakdowns. And then overall site right now, we're at about 1,150 stalls total, so that will give you some sense of full build out what we can handle at this point. Um, some other features here moving into this more the center of the site. Um, we have a large grandstand here with tractor pull areas happening in here and then this area would be overflow parking or possibly pits for the tractor pull areas. We have an area in here for the midway rides um, and then located in between the FFA building and 4-H building and the business expo building is the large detention pond which handles a lot of the storm runoff 
And then making that a usable feature, we actually included a, a amphitheater. And as you can see here, there's a capacity from anywhere from approximately 250 or less, obviously, um, but up to 100 or up to 1,000 in capacity. So that we're really looking at areas that we can generate revenue for the fairgrounds, even when the fair is not going on. So we've also included features such as uh, security fencing and um, uh, entry gates, uh, welcome centers. So options that can be included don't necessarily need to be, but here is a, is a fence system and, and an entry here where you're paying your tickets and entering for uh, events both at the amphitheater and at the grandstand. So there's a way to control crowd there. So I know I ran, rambled through that pretty quickly, so stop me if you have any questions, but um, if you don't right now, I think we'll jump into the phase one. So all that we, we just looked at was kind of master plan, big, big picture stuff, and then what we're doing here is pulling down to that first phase where we're just getting the earth moved and prepping the site. So here's the, the full master plan again with the grading contours that fit and make sure everything works properly and grades properly. And then we're taking that Pairing it down to just the phase one stuff, so we'll see existing conditions, the demo, the site prep, uh, erosion control plans, grading plans, layout plans, site details, landscape plans. In this case, it's mostly seeding. We're not doing a lot of above the ground landscaping in this phase. Um, electrical service, water service, and stormwater service are the infrastructures involved in this first phase. So in this one, you can see this is kind of the existing condition site. There are some drain tiles out there that will need to be removed during earth, earth moving equipment. Um, other than that, not a whole lot of site prep. There is a fence along the west side that will likely be, need to be removed just for earth moving purposes. Um, this is the erosion control plan, essentially silt fences to help <coughs> control erosion issues. Um, we have the master grading plan. So this, this particular sheet, there's a couple of these where they're called the master grading plan is where we've looked at all the infrastructure that's needed to make the whole entire site work and then taken that back to the phase one. So this is the master plan for grading. And there's the kind of extents of the, of the grading of phase one. You can kind of see here's the, the line. This would be the layout plan. So you can kind of see on this one the extents of the, the gravel roadway coming in here is the access turnaround. You have parking here and here. And then there's also areas shown on the map maybe hard to see, um, where we're showing where the future as, as material and, and money comes in from donations where they can expand um, immediately without having to go out with another bid package. This is the landscape plan showing the different areas of seating. We obviously have sports turfs in the outfield. We have um, some drainage plantings along some of the swales. And then also we've talked about a cover crop or some sort of crop over the fairgrounds area where um, it's not necessarily being used yet, but we can still generate some revenue through farming activities until that development happens over there. And this is the electrical service master plan. So we're showing service to the future quads and to the future DNR center as well as all throughout to the fairgrounds facilities. And then phase one electric, we're, we're pulling all that back and stopping it at this level. So we're making it through the parking area so there isn't any disturbance when that fire or electric service, excuse me, needs to come through there. We don't have to tear up anything. <coughs> it's already in place and ready to go with future expansion. <coughs> um, this again is coming up to this point in phase one and then coming up into the diamond area and then just a little bit further. So when we do add on and go north this way and this way, there's no disturbance of the existing facilities. Oh, excuse me, sorry. Um, same thing with the water service here. Um, the big idea is we're connecting to the city water line over on this side. Um, there's an existing main. Uh, we have eight inch water service coming in to the diamonds to this point. And then that's pretty much all at this point. But you can see the future shows um, access, wa water access into the f fairground site and then also looping up to the future arterial road. So in phase one, that's what we're looking at for the water service. Um, but it's important, again, to show that we have it planned on the future expansion there. Um, again, the stormwater master plan shows all the, all the intakes and everything needed for the full build out. And then it's kind of parred down with a bunch of notes for just the phase one. Um, 
this is the cost estimate. I don't know if you want to walk through this or not, um, Fred, but basically what we've done here um, is taking a look at all the things that we wanted to include. And we've provided some alternates, and there's a list of them there. They're not in any pr priority level at this point, but that is something that we'll want to deal with. But it really allows options um, as, as donations come in. As Fred has indicated, there may be opportunities for that to happen. It op offers opportunities for flexibility within the bid package if we can break out those different alternates that may come in separately. So that's kind of what we're showing there. Some of the alternates just to go through would be the sidewalks and the interior um, fields. Um, that's something that we've shown in the plans, but it's an alternate. It doesn't need to go in. The diamond infields, again, it may be a budget issue. Um, electric service, that, that could be an alternate that could come in later, um, but we're showing it in this package as well just to get pricing on it and et cetera. Are there any design questions at this point? You know, I laid a lot on you there. So. No, it looks good. <coughs> a question about the over the the additional parking, grass parking, I think. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and if that's meant for expansion later, um, and does expansion mean paved? And if so, at what point are the water uh, runoff issues <clears throat> addressed, or are they already? Yeah, the idea is that we're uh, providing gravel or aggregate lots and roadways at this phase, but they will be set up for the base for future concrete uh, walkways and, and uh, roads. So at this point, and it's part of the alternates, is there's sub-drain, drain tile essentially, that's uh, located within the parking lots to, to handle that runoff until we do full concrete, and then we'll, we'll switch to the intake systems, um, and then that will be rerouted through different piping. But again, the idea, looking with the civil engineer, is um, to put in the infrastructure now that we don't have to take out later. We can just either add on to it, or we don't need it right now, so we'll, we'll hold off on it until that future expansion need is, it arises. And the existing tiling that you're taking out, there's no use for that. I mean, I'm not an engineer, but um, I mean, that has to all be taken out in order to do the work that you're doing. It doesn't contribute or has the potential to contribute in any way to the, to the water? Um, at this point, I think we're doing enough earth moving to get to the, the areas that we need for flattened out for buildings and for sports fields. I don't think a lot of those will be able to be reused. And generally, I think when you take them out, they're in a condition that you couldn't reuse them. Um, that's not to say that some of it may not be able to be saved. Um, there's notes in the, in the demo package, actually, to describe that the contractor will have to coordinate um, the transition zones, because there will be lines um, heading outside of our extents of our work here that we'll have to compensate for. And what's a mud bog? <laughs> A mug bug is a, it was kind of an optional feature that we thought of in the design team of a, you know, you have the tractor pull area, but there may be an area for, you know, a wetland, or not wetland, that's the wrong word, but kind of just a mud bog. So really it's just a design feature where you're draining to the center of the site rather than crowning and draining away from it. Excuse me. It's something that people will pay to go watch. Yeah. Yeah. There are other questions about the um, the design and specifications. We'll be happy to answer those. Um, the uh, the cost estimate that <coughs> uh, Confluence has come up with uh, for the primary earthwork and associated infrastructure is somewhere in the vicinity of 2.4 million, which um, frankly was probably higher than what we anticipated. Um, we had had some preliminary numbers early on in the project from structure that were um, uh, less than that, and we certainly, um, you know, don't know what, uh, what sort of uh, result we would get from actually bidding uh, the package that's been described, but uh, obviously Confluence has 
exercise their due diligence in trying to come up with uh, an estimate. So um, clearly this brings us up to a couple of uh, key points. One is obviously fundraising and uh, fundraising has been going on, is going on, will be going on. Um, we have uh, initiated a number of uh, very meaningful conversations with some potential donors for this project that could make a very substantial impact uh, on uh, uh, the funding for this project. I, I don't want to go into any great detail. These are conversations that are ongoing um, and um, I would say that there's a good likelihood that we would bring those to a conclusion sometime within the next four to eight weeks. Um, there are, it, it involves several uh, corporate entities. Uh, there are a number of layers that we have to work through. Um, but I can say that there has been uh, a very, um, heartwarming reception of the project and that there are um, folks out there who are willing to take that bold step of demonstrating su community support for the project, uh, which we think will not only get this jump started, but will start the snowball running down the hill in a hurry. Um, and in terms of what we have in hand at the moment, uh, we are at approximately $240,000. Um, uh, majority of that, three quarters of it, is in actual cash contributions, the rest of it in pledges. And we have also been um, collecting intentions for uh, in-kind contributions, most of which is above ground work. Uh, fencing, cement work, uh, carpentry, um, lighting, le electrical work, and so on. And uh, we're at about 200K plus, and there are still more uh, folks out there that are interested in joining in the project. So uh, clearly we have our work cut out for us in terms of being able to uh, build up our coffers to the point where um, we would be in a position that we can start thinking about letting a bid on this project. Um, and that's another uh, element here that uh, uh, council needs to be mindful of. At this point in time, I, I think most of us are in agreement in terms of talking with city staff uh, that the bidding for the project will have to follow City of Waverly um, public bidding protocol. Um, there was a time when there was a thought that, that because the fair is a 5013C and the softball association is a 501C3, that as uh, nonprofit entities basically uh, developing the land owned by the city, that we could basically negotiate with a contractor if we wanted to rather than bidding. Um, but I think uh, one of the significant factors in terms of looking at public bidding is that the City of Waverly is in fact the owner of the land. Um, so, uh, you know, we will probably need to go through those uh, standard steps of uh, approving the design and, and uh, specs and thinking about putting it out bid. Now, I think if that's the route we do end up pursuing, uh, there's also the potential, I suppose, that the winning, winning bidder could, we could sit down with and, and have a conversation about the project in terms of ways in which um, some of our in-kind contributions might help offset uh, the uh, project or whether the the winning bidder would be interested in making some type of in-kind contribution, but I don't know, Phil, if you want to shed any additional light on that. 
I think when Bill and I just did research earlier, late last week, I guess it was now, today's Monday, right? Um, it was pretty clear that if we owned it, it was our project. And so there's one little provision about private funds going towards private construction. Maybe you can clarify that. But There's an exception in the bidding uh, requirements if you have a specific amount of money that's given for a specific project. So it, it would have to be all of the money for that particular project and it would have to be designated and they could control who performed that work or that uh, did that building or did that uh, work. And so it's in this big of a project and with that much involvement with what the city is already involved in, it might be kind of difficult to, to do that, but um, that would be more like a, a specific building in a, you know, in a, in a, an improvement. A park shelter house or something. Yeah, right, where you can just identify, I'm giving this money and I'm going to have this, this person build it for us. But in this kind of a project, a little bigger than that, it's, it's probably fairly difficult to avoid the public bidding procedures. And in conjunction with, with that uh, reality, uh, we understand, we, we as Champions Ridge folks, stakeholders, understand that we would need to have uh, the dollars in hand in order to be able to pay the bills on a, on a contract with a, a construction company that would do the work. Um, we would assume that the city of Waverly doesn't want to assume uh, liability for paying construction bills. Uh, so um, that's one of the key factors, I think, in moving forward is us uh, uh, generating enough donations that uh, all of us feel comfortable moving forward in terms of uh, letting bids on the, on the project. And that, as I said, uh, will likely take us at least a, another uh, month to two months, potentially. Um, one other development that uh, I think is uh, helpful, uh, some of you on council perhaps may remember that there was a memorandum of understanding that was developed um, uh, mostly between the uh, Fair Association and the ball groups regarding how Champions Ridge would operate. Uh, everything from, you know, who's responsible for paying garbage bills and snow removal and whatever else. Uh, just uh, uh, trying to lay out clearly uh, where various responsibilities would, would lie and, and how scheduling might be done and that sort of thing. As part of that memorandum of understanding, a Champions Ridge governing board uh, is proposed and it would um, be made up of three representatives from the Fair Association, three representatives from the ball groups, one at-large member uh, that is a resident in Bramer County and is approved by the, uh, the six uh, representatives from Fair and Ball. Um, and then we also had talked about the fact that in all likelihood, we would arrange for council to appoint a liaison to that governing board so that there's uh, an ongoing channel of communication. But the, uh, you know, we, when that was initially conceived, it was conceived as something that would oversee the actual operation of Champions Ridge. I think we all agree that it would be good to have that governing board in place sooner rather than later. As we move forward and start to get a little more serious about exactly uh, what's going to be done at the site, when it's going to be done, um, and uh, engage in some uh, conversations, both with city staff and uh, potentially a, a contractor, having that governing board in place to make some of the decisions and guide the process would make for a much cleaner sort of um, uh, protocol to, uh, to follow. So uh, we are going to put our attention to putting together that governing board um, in the next 
I'll say the next month, hopefully. Uh, obviously, we need people to agree to serve. Uh, we've already done a little bit of groundwork on that. So, uh, but I think that will be um, a helpful structural change for us that will uh, simplify communications uh, with all of the parties that are involved. Um, and I might mention that earlier today we did meet with the Burma County Board of Supervisors, essentially did this sort of review with them, uh, and they very much appreciated it. And uh, they're interested as well in trying to develop some system for regular communication between this project and, and the <coughs> Board of Supervisors. Uh, I think it was it was well received by them, and and they appreciated being being kept in the loop. Um, and the last thing I'll just hit on is that uh, we fully recognize that our fundraising efforts right now are are critical. Um, there are some some conversations that have started over a year ago that are still moving forward. Um, and we're anticipating that we can bring them to fruition uh, here within a fairly short time span. But there are a lot of moving parts uh, to uh, what we've been working on, and so uh, we're hoping we can get all of that to fall into place just as soon as possible. Uh, and I, I have to say that, um, again, there's, there's clear evidence of strong support for the project. Um, there are a lot of folks who are very interested, who simply want to see things happening. Uh, and so we're trying to keep our focus on doing things that will lead us in that direction. So with that, I'll just open it up to any general questions or issues that folks may have. Fred, at one point we'd had some serious conversation with the DOT as far as what was needed for um, when it's fully developed as far as interchanges, that type of thing. It appears here that we've kind of backed away from doing that on the front end and we're going more with just a... My understanding is, and Mike and Ben can correct me, is that traffic counts will drive that. and given the sporadic sort of traffic flow that the fair would be creating and that obviously the ball groups would be creating that we would not be in a position where we have to have a full-blown um, turn lane intersection developed right from the get-go that could happen down the road but uh, i think we would depend on the iowa dot or I know Snyder did a traffic study. I don't know if there was a trigger in that. Um, but the current word is that at least for the short term, and I would say that's over the next five to eight year period, um, traffic flows with events that are happening at the site would not warrant uh, a heavy investment on intersection improvements. Um, essentially, my understanding of it is that the entrance that's been proposed and planned in terms of what Confluence has designed is a commercial grade kind of entrance off of Highway 3. Um, I don't know if anybody has any other insight on that. Just the fact that the DOT did the access improvements and, and realizes that you know, traffic counts are warranted, uh, more improvements would be needed, so the idea of Improving the minimal amount right now, knowing that it's going to be a traffic Is that a fair assessment, Mike? Yeah. 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 I guess I would just say, you know, I really appreciate you taking the lead on this. I know you stepped up and did that, and that's been a 
I'm sure a lot of work on your part, so that's good. But um, it, you know, to me, it's something Waverly's needed for a long time with the ball diamonds, for sure, um, and the fair as well. Needed more space. You we're know, building so, um, just for the public. I mean, it's it's inevitable. This is going to happen. The fair is moving. They're paying for the land. This is all going to happen at some point. It's just as when you know. So precisely. Um, and, I, and I, I just have to say, I, I, on a formal level, I got started in this in spring of 2010. Um, and uh, so it's going on five years that I've been operating as a um, spokesperson for the project. And uh, it's not, it hasn't been all peaches and cream. Um, and I, I just have to say that what impresses me uh, the most is the enthusiasm, the perseverance, the tenacity, the commitment that that people on the fair side and the ball side have exhibited over this period of time. I mean, uh, it is a complicated project. It's got lots of uh, interested parties, uh, you know, City of Waverly, the Bremer County Supervisors, the Fair Association, the ball groups. Uh, a number of other community organizations, and uh, uh, keeping everybody on the same page uh, is not as difficult as I anticipated it would be because everybody is fully committed to the to the project. Yes, it's occasionally frustrating um, in terms of we move so far and then discover that there's something else that we need to take care of, um, but we've worked through all of those over the last four or five years, and I'm convinced that we'll get through the rest of them. And uh, I am buoyed by the fact that I've been doing a lot of talking to people around the Waverly community and even out in the county about this project, and there is support for it. People do understand the need. I mean, when, when Little League kids are being disappointed by the fact that their fields are flooded halfway through the ball playing season, uh, it hits home to people that why can't we have a place where, where we can count on having activity. Lots of other communities uh, have that and we are well behind on, on that front. Uh, and the fair as well, you know, they are anxious to get out where they have a little bit of elbow room and space to be able to maneuver and do something. And I have to say the youth are the ones that are really pushing this. Um, we've had an information table at the last couple of fairs, and it's absolutely amazing how many kids come up and look at the project and say, man, when is this going to happen? You know, and it's never soon enough for them, but uh, they're gung-ho. Uh, so I, I remain very confident that this will happen. It, I realize it's not going as quickly as what everybody would like it to, but. <coughs> Um, it's a good thing that will eventually come to reality. Fred, you'd mentioned on the agreement the city has with the, the fair that uh, there's a process of discounting the cost per acre, and that stipulation is based on the county matching the city's contribution. Mm -hmm. Do we know where they're at? I know they did match the request on the first year. Have they made a second year commitment or? I don't know, Chris, might you know where they're at? I, I don't know that the budget is finalized for this year yet. I, I would say, you know, judging by the conversations that, well, the one we had today and, and what I've heard in a couple of previous meetings, I, I think the supervisors are cautious but supportive, and I think they will find a way to make that work. I mean, it's... Uh, it's a, it's a good deal for the fair and the county uh, to enter into that, but. I think the fair has demonstrated that they can meet their financial end of it that the county was looking for, and I would hope that they so. would continue to be a partner in this. Well, we're happy to receive, you know, comments, uh, helpful insights, pledge cards, whatever, uh, as the spirit moves you, so uh, don't hesitate to get a hold of me. Um, we will, in all likelihood, be back here in another month or so to uh, 
uh, let you know where we stand on uh, being able to move forward on um, getting some movement out at the site. So stay tuned. Thank you, Fred, and thank you for doing the Bremer County Supervisors today, too. It's good to know that everybody is being brought into the loop and that there is some momentum, and Councilman Gate kind of speaks for us all. We know it's important and, uh, and destined to be, and um, we'll do all we can. Thank you. Appreciate thank you, Fred. <clears throat> the second item on tonight's study, well, any more discussion? Do you want to cut anybody off? The second item on tonight's study session agenda is a discussion of the Scott and Tammy McKinsey property on Crestwood Avenue on which we hold an option to buy. I'd like to ask for comments and lead in from the city administrator. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, six months ago, we uh, took out an option on this parcel after we were approached by Scott and Tammy McKenzie on the corner of uh, 8th Street and Crestwood Avenue Southeast and abuts uh, about 20 plus acres that the city currently owns in that area. Um, some may recall that we initially purchased uh, the bulk of that land north of the soccer fields for youth ball diamonds. And uh, with the advent of Champions Ridge and it moving forward, we have not developed those diamonds there uh, and, and have used that as, as income producing farmland. At the time we put this option together, uh, it included the, the home and about four acres, more or less, uh, at that site, uh, part of which is a um, old borrow pit or old quarry. And the idea was the addition of that land could be kind of wrapped into the overall site development of that area someday, whether it be for stormwater or for uh, grading purposes. And there had also been discussion in the past. Um, some of those houses have had flooding in them due to the way the river works in that area, and, and we saw that again in 2013. So at the time, we did a six-month option, which expires this month uh, for $1,000 to purchase the property at 110% of the assessed value, and the way we got to that was that was essentially what the buyouts were um, back in the flood. So the assessed value is $143,490, uh, which means the asking price is $157,839. Uh, upon review of it, just from, from my opinion, and, and I'll let Bill share his opinion if he has any long range, it may be good to control that corner as that area redevelops or floodplain. Um, but short term with other pressing needs, including the Green Bridge, I think it's hard to justify uh, that expense right now. Um, however, the option's on the table. So I don't have a strong uh, opinion or strong recommendation either way. But I think that just in, in the past two weeks or so, we've had some other things come to light that we need, may need to spend money on, too. So is the funding available for this? Yes. Uh, there is funding there, whether we use that from a business park fund or other, other fund reserves. But uh, that's also funding that could be going towards other priorities. Bill, I don't know if you have any thoughts. Uh, I would say if we had a strong reason right now or a budding um, development prospect for that site yes but we don't and so I think the timing is such that uh, for a policy decision for council it's just weighing short term versus long term the other 50 acres that we're looking at that the parkway will give us access to will not be in prohibited inhibit nothing will be affected whether we purchase whether we exercise our option or not Right. What this what this option is really for is just that parcel along Crestwood, the, the McKenzie home along Crestwood adjacent to ours. Uh, it doesn't impact access to our side. It doesn't access anything else along the Cedar River Parkway corridor right now. Discussion. What other priorities are you thinking of there, Phil? I mean, 150 whatever thousand dollars I mean for the green bridge is like not gonna do anything is it well you look at so we have 144,000 in the green bridge mm -hmm. and that money will go I think that money can go a ways towards um, engineering for a replacement bridge if that's the case or if there's a short-term fix um, there's also some discussion too about uh, our south industrial park 
and the future there, if there's some willing sellers that would allow us to connect through behind Walmart down to 29th Avenue. Um, and I think that that this property that we own here, this 20 acres, as Champions Ridge moves forward, the need for um, ball diamonds there, I think, is uh, un unclear. Because could we continue to build ball diamonds there and Champions Ridge does their quad of adult diamonds? And yes. But if Champions Ridge builds all three quads, then how many youth ball diamonds do we need? Um, so I think that uh, on, the, on the other side, uh, I don't, you know, you have the option now, and you don't ever want to have to go by and back and buy property twice. Essentially, we're not necessarily doing that, but you have the option here for a set price. So it's not an easy decision. $150,000, $160,000. Yeah, it's $160,000. And so is it worth adding that to our, our current site there for future development? What would it become? Probably stormwater management area because it is generally a low area in the house. And I think there's a, um, a Morton building there or a metal building there too that could be used for a while for storage or something. I mean, as a disclaimer, I, it is a family member here, so I want to be careful, but I don't have any direct interest in the property. But I guess one question I would have, if we don't see the current city acreage being used as ball diamonds, what do we see it being used as? That would be, um, there have been a couple of ideas with that. One idea that we keep circling back to on staff as we look at that land is basically going out for uh, requests for development proposals. To take those since we're the, the owner we kind of get um, uh, the benefit of maybe receiving a lot of proposals for that because it could uh, develop as business condominiums or um, light industrial flex it could develop as commercial space or multifamily or continue the the uh, single family that's there next to it now so there's a bunch of options especially with access now opening up this whole south side of that with the parkway uh, and having another way in and out of that neighborhood. So we haven't settled on anything, but I think knowing that there's, I think, probably 15-plus acres that are out of the floodplain um, towards the southwest, the northeast is kind of in the lower part of that field, um, there is a good potential there to develop it to maybe meet whatever our priorities are now. We've talked a lot about business um, sites, business park for offices, and we've also talked a lot about housing. What does the future comprehensive land use plan indicate it as? I think it shows, right now it looks like ag. And what color is yellow? Commercial. All right. residential. Residential. Oh, yellow is so residential. It's, it's yeah. some green and, so it's, right now it shows it as public, governmental, church, recreational, and residential border area, mixed with mixed use to the south. I guess the reason I asked the question was I think going back on our discussion when we put in for the option was if that was going to be developed, whoever developed is going to have to do something with sure. water retention, that type of thing, and it may make the rest of the property more valuable if that's already a piece of it, I guess. And, and that was the initial concept was that that site, because of its current topography, would blend in well with the lower part of the other site and become more of a stormwater management program. Now, let's say that let's say that property was purchased. What would be the plan? Would what would you do with the house? Well, you, and from a short term, they may demolish it. If that if that's the case, then what are the costs associated with that? Uh, probably what we've done with other properties, uh, ag properties. Obviously, there's no building on them, so we just rent them out. Uh, this one, that's their current living in the house so it's in good shape so you could rent out the house for a period of time until there was a plan put together and and just do more of a shorter term lease arrangement with it and I think we Mike, do we have bids back on demolition costs for homes on the dry run do we know about ballpark what that those costs are uh, I think they're running about 15,000 a piece a home There's a um, there's a new house, um, not too far away from it, or a newer house. What happens? 
I mean, it's, it's uh, adjoining that property. What happens to that? Well, that house, I believe it is or was currently on the market for sale. Um, there's, there's no plans for anything with that house right now. I mean, it's, it's owned right now, right? Yeah, I know it recently was on the market. It just was put on the market. But we don't have a plan to purchase it or anything like that. This is one of those that yeah. came to us. I, uh, your opening summary is, I mean, I agreed with that pretty much completely. I mean, the land right now is sandwiched between residential on each side, so it makes more sense to sometime down the road have developers bid and they can put single family houses there or apartments or whatever, you know, they deem that would be nice. But since there's no reason or pressing issue for us to buy it now, there's no business that wants to go there now, there's nobody that wants to develop it today. We don't have many plans today to use it. Um, you take this 160, put it with the 150 in the Green Bridge Fund, you, know, you have $300,000 right there that could go to mm -hmm. Maybe we come back and there's a short-term fix for the Green Bridge that can buy us five more years until we can, you know, get some more money and 300000 could could replace a couple things or do a couple things. And there's, to me, that's way more important than buying something that maybe possibly might be used 20, 30 years down the road. I mean, there's more important things now to do than to buy something that might be used, maybe, that but we have no concrete plans of what that might be. I think that makes a certain amount of sense too, but I, I guess I just, I am just real wary of, I mean, unless I'm missing something, I'm just real wary of keeping, holding out this hope that, you know, for even $300,000, we can do something with the Green Bridge that is substantial. And, and I'm, not, I'm not advocating, it's not an argument to get rid of it, I, I just think we need a plan. I'll just say that again, we just need a plan. And, and I think that, mm -hmm. that based on some preliminary feedback from the, from the engineers and, and a quick look at their report, which we'll send out tomorrow, um, it's whatever we do is going to be expensive in short term. And um, trying to find some way to even do a, a multiple month repair that could get us through until it's time, you know, we've done the engineering and a replacement is funded and can be started, um, is not going to be cheap. But and then, so then that's yeah. the discussion. What, what does that look like, not cheap? I wonder if, I mean, I, I think, well, just to say, I think our topic here is buying yeah. property. And so the with this one, it I is, but it's related because we keep coming back to the, all. well, Personally, it keeps, being, it keeps being brought up as a reason. Well, one so, of the reasons that Phil offered as to why we shouldn't would be to put some of that money towards doing something with the Green Bridge. Sure. Yeah. So that's where the relationship is. You could also it's, say it's it all money. Anything, though. Right. Yeah. We could yeah. save and have everything we do. Relief. Right. Yeah. I think the only, from our point of view, the only, the only thing about, um, it's a, again, it's a tough decision on this because you don't want to be short-sighted. You, you don't want to pass up something today that might come in very useful when you go to develop that site. And I think that's the tough weighing of the balance. I think at the time when the site does get developed, which is probably 10, 20, 30 years away, I'm assuming, somebody can, will be able to buy, if they need this land, they can buy it. I mean, I don't. Yeah, our, our idea would be much closer in timeline than that. And quite frankly, one of the reasons we've been waiting on this is to figure out what happens with Champions Ridge. Do we need youth ball diamonds here or not? And that's why it was good to get the update tonight before we did, wanted to discuss this because um, it depends on how you develop the site. And that's why we've been holding it is to say, well, you can either have a youth sports complex here with the soccer field, with shared parking and access and all of that now. Um, but if you don't need that, if you don't need a youth ball diamonds here, then we want to start marketing the site this summer and get the development going because we know we, we need it. I don't know if it's going to work or not, but, but we at least want to put it on the market. I, I would think that that site once... Once the Cedar River Parkway there is open to 4th, 4th Street, at least, it becomes a desirable developmental site. I don't see 20, 30 years, you know, 10 years to fully fill it in probably, but, you know, I, I see in the next few years actually something happening there uh, on a more quicker timeline. But I, I, I'm agreeing with 
Wes, I guess I don't, and what your initial thought was, I, I hate to, to pass up the, the opportunity to, to have control of some land within there for some internal development, but we already have a chunk of land there that can be developed as it is. Um, and I, I think either, you know, either using the money somewhere else or not using the money at all is a, is a better, better option at this point, just based on things that have been happening. Um, I'd be, per, personally, I, I, um, if the land is worth developing, I would allow a developer to buy it and develop it as opposed to the city. In this part of town anyway, it's, you know, it's not an area that we would turn into a, you know, it's not on the south side of town for more industrial. I think that's the type of business we would stay in as far as buying speculative real estate land to hope that we'd sell it someday. I'd like to leave that to the developers. And uh, probably the first reason, second reason, quite frankly, I don't think we can afford it. Sometimes we have to say no. Well, the property is not going anywhere. I mean, it's going to be what it is. If someone developer wants to develop it in three years, it's still going to be there, and it's still going to be for sale. So, I don't. Yeah, I agree with Dave. I don't see why the city would buy <laughs> land just to turn around and then sell it back to a developer. I'd, I'd like to. I'm a little bit concerned that that we would kind of even say that this might be an, an option in case Champions Ridge doesn't work out. Um, just for that reason alone, I, I don't want to have any type of discussion like that. I think I don't think we should pursue it at all. That's just the history of why we purchased those 20 acres. Yeah, and plus there's another house there that we, there's like two houses there that we'd have to deal with. And personally, I think it's probably good development land and. Somebody might buy it and put a nice house in there, and I guess I'd be okay with that. That's my personal opinion, but um, it, it's prime for somebody to buy it and put a nice house next to the other newer house. Where does this property sit in the flood determination as far as 500-year, 100-year flood? Actually, there's, it's a mixed, that whole uh, 20, 30 acres right there. Um, that corner, the, the northeast corner, um, that is 8th, the corner of 8th and... Uh, What's the other? Crestwood? Mm -hmm. But the house is, is, the house is actually is in the 100 year floodplain. Um, and there's a strip of 500, 500 year floodplain across the kind of the diagonally across the middle. And then there's about eight to nine acres that are currently out of either floodplain. But the, the movement of dirt in that area could actually create um, probably more out of the floodplain. Um, right, but that, as the it house sits itself right is now, in the 100 year. It's in the hundred year. Yeah. Yeah. So really, as it sits right now, it's not developable. All three homes are actually in the hundred year flood. In a hundred year. Yeah. yeah. The idea when we when we looked at it was really, you know, and again, the idea of it being low lying that it was a good area for a detention or for retention as far as for allowing the rest of the property that the city already owns to be <coughs> developed fully. And have that as kind of that that spillover and just you know 150,000 for the retention area. It's, we can use the money better, I think. And if, if you sell the city, we sell the rest of the land to a developer, and they need this for a retention basin, they can go negotiate and buy it for what they want to buy it for. It wasn't a bad 1,000 op purchase option to, to have. But the way things have come out. It's not, not worth it at this point to me just to push forward with it. I think the city will prioritize that green bridge extremely high and um, anything we can do in that direction. And while I know we can, I, at least I, as I understand it, this is a purchase, purchasable piece of property for us within our cash flow, but I protect, I think I'd like to see a protection for the green bridge and even if it's out of range we'll be closer any more last comments do we need to take any formal action or just let the option we just let it expire no we can't and i mean we'll contact them and let them know but the option just expired okay Last comments from anyone? Our third 
study session agenda item is our progress on our airport improvement effort. Turn back to the city administrator. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, tonight is the night that we come back and, and give you an update on where we are with property and talk about moving forward, uh, specifically the ability to exercise eminent domain or begin the proceeding. Uh, we've been in negotiations since probably, t well, a long time, but more recent history is 2012 and then uh, specifically 2013, I think, is when we really uh, started. The end of 13. The end of 13. And uh, we have been working on easements where able uh, to do the smallest amount of purchased land or deed held land as possible. To date, we've acquired 47.4 out of the 70.52 acres or about 67% of the land we need. Uh, most of that has come from Bill Lowe and then Jim Jansen and finally the Mueller Farms. Um, what's left is a 1.4 roughly acre easement with the Schmitz. Uh, half acre easement and then seven and a quarter acre purchased through from the Burkles and about 14 acres from the uh, Miller estate. So what we've included is all of the um, negotiations and information that we have with those uh, three folks and really are just trying to paint the picture of where we've come from, the discussions we've had and, uh, and really where we stand today. And in order to move forward, the next step includes um, this uh, sample resolution here and then an actual resolution at a future council meeting uh, to have the council give authorization to the staff and specifically Bill to implement the proceedings. And as you recall, these proceedings include a, uh, I believe it's a court appointed board that meets to review the issue and set fair market values for each property. And um, I think now I'll just turn it over to Bill to give some more background and give you an update on each of the individual properties and where we are. The memo uh, described kind of the, where we've been or, and where we are now. Um, the Burkles were just apart, were quite a ways apart in the value. Um, the clan properties, uh, we really just have never gotten a, a demand for a specific dollar amount. Um, there's been discussion about using the FAA's relocation um, process, which allows for replacing certain things, especially if you're buying out somebody's home. They can buy a replacement home that can be paid for, even if it's higher in value. Um, but the FAA has told me that that's not available to the Miller heirs, um, but they still, as of uh, today, the memo or the, uh, the email that I've gotten are still trying to get us to pay for replacing the machine shed and the other improvements on the property in addition to paying fair market value for the land. Um, and we've tried to just say we're willing to, to I mean, we've, we've increased the offer up to 10%. We've reduced the number of acres by a few acres um, by redrawing the lines. Um, and we're really at a point where we just can't do these things because if, if we want to do them, we have to pay for them. It, you know, the extra money that we would pay would not be reimbursed totally by the FAA. They would reimburse 90% of what they felt was a reasonable sum. But beyond that, you'd be on your own if you added money to that that was not um, approved by the FAA. So even though the FAA has been pretty reasonable about, you know, telling us to go ahead and approximately give the extra 10%, um, they're not they're they're not unlimited in what they'll be willing to do, so we're we're sort of at a dead <coughs> deadlock with with these, the, and the Schmitz, you know, we had some early discussions with them in, a, in as a group with the other landowners, but just haven't received any cooperation or any response to our inquiries. Mayor and, Miller, are you talking? Was that Schmitz? Schmitt or Schmitz. Okay. Yep. Um, we just want to have dialogues because they are eligible if they would want to sell their entire property for relocation um, expenses, which is quite good because they, they move you. You can buy a property that's similar. It could even be more expensive. And they allow for a higher reimbursement rate for somebody who's being moved. So there are a number of benefits to being, you know, to, to having that happen. But we are only asking for the easement. We're not 
in any way forcing them or telling them that we want to buy their property. Um, their, their property easement is quite high in dollar amount because it's taking most of the trees between their um, acreage and the, and the airport. Now there is a kind of a ridge, so it's not as if they have no block because they kind of have a, kind of go over a little swale to get to their place. So it's not like they're gonna stand there and now have no trees and everything's right there. Um, but it is a significant taking and that's why it took so long to get their appraisal and they did the valuation on the trees, uh, which in, that was attached in your, in your uh, paperwork. So it, it, it gets us up to where our last offer was a little over $90,000 and it's really only a 1.37 acres, but it's the value of the trees we're taking. So that's where we're at on this, those three properties. Um, I, I would point out that our appraisals are over a year old, um, in some cases maybe a year and a half old. Um, property land or, or farmland prices um, have been reported to come down between 10 and 15 percent from their high and we basically got appraisals done during the high time so in fact we're probably being very generous with these appraisals if we if we're continuing to use those in our eminent domain proceedings um, I think with the dollar amounts we're talking about I don't want to spend the extra money for an appraisal unless the co council felt that we should um, because it might result in 10 or 15 percent reduction in what we offer but at this point I think it's just more important to go in and get the uh, uh, proceeding started it isn't a terribly long process unless somebody contests the the uh, our need to take the property but this is not the kind of um, taking that I think is can be questioned because it's for a uh, uh, FAA re required safety zone in order for us to qualify for their program to get their grant money. So I think at this point, um, it would just be a matter of moving forward, letting the, um, the commissioners, the, uh, the people who establish values, just establish the value that they think we have to pay, because whatever they establish, the, the FAA will approve. So at that point, we won't be, we'll just be presenting our appraisals and we'll be saying that's what we want to pay and it'll be a decision that'll come through that process. Discussion? <clears throat> Maybe to step back a little bit. Um, probably the first question I had just last, um, the safety zone is required to get grant money from the FAA. I don't, I guess I thought several times in the past we talked that we didn't, we didn't have to have that safety zone to get funding from FAA. I believe it's we don't have to have it to get maintenance money, okay. but for lengthening the, the runway, I believe we need that for lengthening the runway. So lengthening the runway, but the current this year we're completely redoing that the will runway. not be affected. Yeah, it won't be affected. Right. Okay. Also, question: I mean, the eminent domain. I guess if and we can talk if we agree or not to that. We haven't approved that yet, though. That's right. That's what I that's have. That's what we're talking that's about. That's what we're tonight. asking about. Right? Yeah. That's the next. That's the next step. I would like to do is ask for that. Okay. Oh, yeah. So and that wouldn't be decided tonight. It would be decided at an upcoming meeting. Right. That's okay. It, it's on the it, it's on the agenda, the proposed agenda for March second, but it could also be removed and moved to another date. I wonder just the letters that went to that. I was just kind of reading through the letters. Did the people understand that? The eminent domain process is not automatic. As I read the letters, if I would have got the letter, I would have kind of thought that I was pressured to maybe uh, sell because otherwise I'll just lose it by eminent domain. Do the people understand that this is not an automatic? I, well, just, I, when you say it's not an automatic, if you prove that it's a need for the public use, then it's just a question of how much. It's not a question of whether you are able to use eminent domain. But the council Once you get has over to the first prove, question. The council has to prove that first. The, the council would have to approve the use of eminent domain. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And we haven't done that yet. Right. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Okay. And 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 I I do use that language when I'm doing dis discussions because that is the logical next step is to move to eminent domain. Yeah. Um, I guess the lawyer in me doesn't. Yeah. Argued the other side in the same letter. So it, yeah, I'm seeing. I you know I'm seeing both sides. I understand what you're sure. saying. You're you're writing the letters correctly, but looking at the other side, if I got that letter in the mail, I would 
I would I would sink in my chair thinking, oh, well, I don't have any options, but they need to, be, to know that they do. To be fair, yeah. we had a discussion with everybody present um, in the beginning where, where Schmitz were present, and they there was discussion about that. Then there's been lots of discussions with the Miller's uh, attorneys, and before they had an attorney, we had several sit-down meetings where we discussed that exact situation, that it was we would have to get permission from the, the council, and that, that's how we would move forward with that. And same with the Burkles. And the Burkles the same way, yes. I mean, I was... So it's not just launched, you know, without explanation. Right. I had an opportunity to sit down at the Burkles at their kitchen table, and it was explained very well that here's the options we'd like to negotiate, and here's the parameters that we can negotiate in. If that doesn't come to a resolution, the next step would be to then yeah. take the direction we're talking tonight. So I think at least the conversation I was involved in, it was clear that they weren't being, we weren't jumping to that as the first step in the process. And I think just to add, that's why we've waited so long to come to this step is because we've worked to negotiate and negotiate. And we have acquired um, two thirds of the property before endeavoring in this fashion. And just to be fair, we've, we're acquiring the, the Bill Lowe property Wednesday and we're requiring the other two, the Mueller and the uh, Jansen uh, next week. Right. Is, is this, this kind of looks like it's the only properties that actually include a residence though? Um, the so. Miller property was destroyed by fire. The house was destroyed by fire before the negotiations began. But these, these have actual residences and the other ones look right. like, right. I mean, you can actually see that if you look at the, Right, right. You can cite the chance. Burkles the, have a residence, but their yeah. buildings and, re and their residence is not affected, except for the fact that we're taking uh, property closer to their structures. And they don't lose anything. I, I, there might have been a one tree, but I don't think they lo lost anything. You know, Schmitz do lose a <coughs> number of trees. Right, most of their trees. Right. Um, if you take a look at them, um, there's a variety <laughs> of trees, some maybe some valuable, some not as valuable, but they're all a, 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 a break, you know, a, a, a buffer. So that is a loss to have, to lose your trees, certainly. And yes. I was just gonna, as far as going back history-wise, history as far as the Miller property, that we had actually had an agreement right. prior to Mr. Miller's passing and- We had a verbal agreement with Mr. Miller, right. uh, apparently uh, before, he passed, um, and that's changed. I mean, it, it really isn't, they aren't unwilling to sell. The question's always been the dollar amount, the right? Property level, or size, how much is being taken. Because that was actually the parcel that kind of kicked the whole thing off. Right, because I remember that being fairly early on that we had had an agreement to, to move forward with that, and we were getting ready to go through the final finalization of it. and unfortunate um so now it's just a matter of reestablishing how we're going to do that and i've always kind of maintained i don't, I, I don't believe the use of the domain to take uh somebody's house is appropriate um and in this case we're not um in in none of the, the these that we're doing uh we have the, the easement opportunities for Burkle and for Schmitz. Um, now, whether it makes the home livable or enjoyable by particularly taking the trees, we have the option to, to go further with the FAA to al allows us to do that. But we got in, as far as when we first started this, when I was first on the council, my our understanding was that we were going to have to take the whole property uh, in order to do it, and, and they came back with the. the decision that would allow us to get the easements and the and uh, right of refusal for future sales, but uh, our first first choice. First and, and we don't even get that. I mean, we're just buying the we're property that we're buying, um, the strip. We're not getting a first right of refusal. We're not getting a first right of refusal. And, and to me, that's, you know, we are acquiring it to get that safety zone and, and improve that area. Um, So where I was hesitant before to use that, and I was even hesitant in, in the case of the dry run project, uh, this is not using it for that purpose. I don't 
have the same hesitation. In terms of the um, safety zone, is the way that the FAA articulates that, is it only connected with a runway extension or would they be recommending this? Forget about the grant for a minute, but just in terms of pure safety questions, would it be recommended for, if a runway this, the size that we currently have would be built now, would they be saying we should have the safety area for safety purposes? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. We've actually, um, according to the airport manager, have been out of compliance with the safety zone for several decades. I mean, I, I think that's a significant factor. Mm -hmm. But even saying that, they are still paying for the entire runway this year for 90% of it. For 90% of, of the rehab of the existing so Even though we're out of compliance, they're fine with keeping yeah. the airport the way it is and keep... Yeah, the, the airport's not out of compliance. I mean, yeah. planes are landing. The airport is not in compliance with this part of the aviation regulations as far as safety zone and... Uh, height as far as a function of length and distance away from the runway. I, th I think so that's where future funding for airport improvements, airside improvements, maintenance is one thing, but any sort of improvements is a different one. Because no. they probably don't want it to get worse than it is. It's grandfathered in some sense is how I'm interpreting what you're saying. But uh, if the same kind of runway were constructed today, they would have different requirements for it. That's correct. Including the safety zone. And, oh, you understand, Mike? Yeah, I guess I, I kind of, the way I've understood it was that, yeah, it's, it's, it's not in compliance, but they're allowing it to go and, and be maintained at the current level. But it's, that's kind of an interpretation of the rules type of thing that at some point they could decide, nope, we're not doing anything unless you get into compliance. It's, you know, I guess the analogy would be similar to the, the school uh, start dates. It's, coming up recently that you know, the rule was that you weren't allowed to start earlier, but they were granting waivers for whatever, and now they just decided to change the rules that they're not going to grant waivers. So, And the federal government could do the same thing to us at any time and say, nope, we're not, we're not granting it anymore. So, I think the other thing we don't want to lose sight of is that um, <coughs> the plan to extend the runway in the, in the future, the extra 400 feet, still will not make this a, 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 a uh, runway that is a, a, of optimum length. I mean, it's still going to be short when it's extended 400 feet, but the 400 feet will add a significant safety factor to the planes that land here now um, because of that additional length. And so that is that was considered a very important factor to wanting to stay in compliance and be able to extend that runway for the safety aspect of that extension. I know, I mean, the main reason we are doing this is our current operator, that company that runs the airport for us and uses it, and I believe probably flies 7 or 90 percent of the flights out of the airport or something like that. Um, they kind of want it longer so they can use their business more, but I guess do we know the long-term outlook of the company that currently runs the airport. I know they do aerial photography and those kind of things and um, seems to me with what's going on in the country these days that the use of airplanes for that's probably not going to be um, all that feasible going forward. I mean with the use of drones and quadcopters and the FAA rules have now said you can, as long as they're in line of sight, you can use them for anything so any private company can buy a quadcopter for 300 bucks and have HD videos and pictures and hover over anything they want and I just wonder the long term you know if we go through with this whole process and then in five or ten years that company that runs the airport no longer exists or changes or what happens to our airport? I mean, and how much money then did we put into this and how much do then we have to, as a city pay to upkeep it because we don't have an operator out there anymore? I'd be interested to more to know about that company and because those times are changing. I mean. I, I don't know about the overall <laughs> financials. I do know they just added um, two more airplanes and a new helicopter to their fleet. And they can't store them all here because they have so many now. So they're storing, 
I think the helicopter and a 206 in Waterloo. So they are adding to their fleet. Um, they do work nationwide, and and what they do is they will um, fly an entire section of a state, and and so it's very large scale, high resolution imagery. Um, but as far as long term and the the rise of the drone, so to speak, I don't know how that will impact their business. I do know that if they were to leave, it would be easier to find another fixed-based operator if you had an easier runway to get planes in and out of. And I think that has been a challenge in the past is finding an operator who just does the fuel and the maintenance without a full aviation side of it in, in this runway environment. Do we know how much... Other activities out there, I've heard up to a million dollars worth of chemicals go through there during the crop dusting season, that type of thing. That's a figure I've heard as well. From um, locally, I know Ag Vantage, uh, Schneider Milling, and then the farmers, now Farmers Winnishie, Farmers Win Co-op use it. Okay. I guess I've, I've captured all the, all the landing data for the last five years, so we want to look at that. But what I found, though, is the usage is very low, especially unique operators on an annual basis is, is uh, quite low. So I, my, my concern is um, for the number of Waverly residents that actually benefit from this, I think it's, personally, I think it's fine. I wouldn't, um, I mean, if to ask today, I, I wouldn't agree with eminent domain um, taking homes uh, for this airport. I think it's been fine. Um, as I look at the uh, map, it looks like that line um, directly dissects the Schmidt house. No. Or the, um, unless it's going to go around it. It does not dissect it. It's actually, it's south of, the property line is south. The pink line, I think I see what Dave's talking about, but, you know, I don't know how accurate this is. You're talking about the... The northern, the that's northern the, line. That's the easement line. E, that's that's a you cannot build any higher than that anymore. So yes, you're right. It does. The line hits the buildings. The, the easement line dissects the. But all that means house. is that they can't go up. They can't add on to it higher. Or they could. They, I mean, you, it'd be impossible to sell that though. I mean, you couldn't sell a house that's got an easement through half of it. it it's a height. Well, it's a. It's an air easement. Aerial easement. Yeah. It's not an easement. I mean, it's an aerial easement that they have con full control of the property. They just can't build on it or, or grow trees. Yeah. I mean, which is why we offered but, to yeah. buy the house. But I'll, buy the I'm realistic. Property. I always think about, you know, yeah. hey, my house is for sale, by the way. It's got an easement through the middle of it. Um, you know, a bad roof is one thing, but. Preferable the flood zone. That's just, that's just my, my take. I guess I've done a lot of, you know, I. I I think the airport is, is good for the city to have. I'm, I'm just not in agreement that um, expanding it and taking homes to do that, we don't, we don't have the, the traffic there to justify it. If we had more traffic, um, more unique uh, actual individuals, more unique Waverly individuals, I'd be for it. That's just my opinion. And I, I haven't found a, a soul that uh, is for it. So and that, that's just... Have we ever received any information on the economic impact? Uh, there the is a the, state report, and I'm actually looking at it right now, um, that was done probably in 2000, let me tell you. Well, your economic impact is going to be on having an airport, and we're not talking about getting rid of it. Yeah, it's the same. I, I can tell you that... Um, you're not going to see a lot of unique users at this airport because of the short field. It's not so much a, a transient stopping through. Um, it's more of a people who are based here who use it and people who are come here for whether it's the college or businesses or something else that use it. So you're going to see more, um, you're going to see the same names or the same planes over and over again just by very nature of they're comfortable with it, they're here, uh, they're doing their maintenance here or whatever. So, um, you know, how much does 400 feet get you as far as additional business or better business future? I, I don't know. That, that's a hard thing to say. I'd probably say not very much. I mean, no one's going to move their plane from Waterloo to Waverly just because we had 400 yeah. feet. But um, 
So you're going to be the same people using it, doing the same things, and it's not very many people using it. It's, and you know, I haven't had, I mean, I kind of agree with Dave. I mean, people ask me why the heck we even talk about this when I, I hear from people because they don't understand the reasoning behind it. But I've, I've heard both. I've heard both negative and positive. To me, I, I, I just don't see how we can ignore, I mean, with any other, you know, housing code or any other, you know, road use issues, you know, that, you know, we, we look at look at the safety guidelines. I, I don't see how we can talk about this and, and, and not talk about that. But, like, how old is the house you live in? My house? What does that have to do with anything? Well, I mean, any, every house in Waverly is behind building specs and building codes unless it's built in the last five, ten years. So if you live in a house that, I used to live in a house that was built in 1903, had knob and tube wiring in the attic. I mean, that was, that's obviously not of the building codes, but the city wasn't going to come force me and buy me out and pay for safety improvements to my house because my house wasn't up to building codes. So. But this is a it doesn't really different, different kind of Art. entity. Was the city running your house? Yeah. That's the, I the guess that's not the really, The city's not running the airport either. Oh, but this this doesn't <laughs> change. This doesn't change anything. It, yeah. I mean, it doesn't. Nothing. Nothing is changed. The only reason we need the safety is if we want the extra four hundred feet. We no, can leave it exactly the way it is, right. and they're paving our runway. I mean, am I am I wrong? And I mean, nothing. Free. No, the houses aren't being pushed out. They're not. I mean, it's it's bare land all the way around except for these residences. And they're just losing ownership, um, and one of them that you're cutting the trees down. But um, I mean, if there's been issues, I can see that. But there, this doesn't. It doesn't make it a safer place. It just. It just. Uh, it'll Events. fit. It'll fit the the regulation. But a different it, regulation for a different length of. It's all runway. farmland around it around it already. Anyways, we're just buying that farmland so that they, no one can build something there. Right, Re and that's removing for safety, the really. vertical obstacles. And extending the runway, the 400 feet does make it a safer place. That's what it. That's what it does do. It does make it a safer place, and then it allows city to continue to have access to the 90-10 split for additional improvements in the future. If you do want to um, construct improvements to try to get more people to use it, to try to make it a benefit long term. So that's what it does. Is it basically either either you open the door to that or you don't? Yeah. And really, I'm, I'd be concerned if you. Uh, you back up the map if we expand this and use it people uh, you know all you know we got we got Waterloo Airport 15 miles away that you know has a um, uh, few flights out of there if we expand this they're gonna be flying right over Hickory Heights and I, I wouldn't be in agreement with that either I mean there's it's it's the wrong place for an airport I don't uh, I don't think we should be expanding usage of it We've got crop dusters, and I, I, I don't live in Hickory Heights, but I live close. We've got crop dusters coming over our house. Where is the right place for it, Dave? It's uh, not in line with the town. <laughs> I mean, look at Waterloo. There's a long ways away. I mean, I mean that's... Uh, I'd, be, I'd be curious... Um, yeah. I mean, I would assume the FAA knows that we've been working on this for couple years now if we would put a stop to it you know, it's probably a question nobody can answer but will they continue to be as understanding that what's there now falls outside of guidelines I mean it's it's one thing to say yeah we'll continue to provide maintenance dollars knowing that you're trying to work with us to, we're going to continue to give you maintenance dollars knowing you don't see a need to work with us. And the good thing is, is they're doing the whole runway this year, so that's 20, 30 years of runway we'll have that we don't have to worry about for a long time. So, <laughs> Other maintenance is the hangars and those kind of things, right? So, this, I mean, the main bulk of the money is the runway that they're repaving for us, So, and that's getting done without impacting any residents or taking away land or cutting down trees or putting easements through the middle of homes. It's, I mean, to me, it still comes down to it's used by, what, 
five, six people a month if you take the company out. I mean, I don't know. It's, it's very small. And it's not a huge revenue generator either. It's not. It actually costs money, us money every year to put into it. But um, Have we you know, have Mike said last, I think, week, three, 4,000 <coughs> cars a day go over the Green Bridge, and we don't want to fix that, but five planes take off a day from the airport and we want to take people's homes for it and land for it? Yeah, this is like five, five, um, again, I don't think we're really, yeah, I don't think we're really talking about taking a home. We're but, giving some options, but, but we're not people, talking about, I do, I do know having talked around and I, I that in terms of, there's an impact be, uh, to me because you have a lot of, um, uh, not just Schneider Milling. You have you have other uh, businesses that take advantage of that airport and enjoy it, and uh, for the business purposes, and uh, and or just for um, <coughs> locating business here. It's a tremendous asset, and that affects jobs and that affects the uh, uh, the future. I would think. Having de dealt with people I know who project how towns grow, this is part of our asset for making the town grow. And um, and, and so I think we have to think carefully uh, uh, and, and positively that, that this is a part of our future. And uh, I think the discussion tonight is important, and I just throw my three cents in that... Um, as as the airport goes, uh, so will the town benefit. And we're not talking about getting rid of the airport, though. So no, Schneider I Schneider Millen is always going to use this airport. It was it was a little doing. bit more to answer, council yeah. resident I mean, checks. Gonna, uh, that, we, that the airport is businesses uh, that use it are going to continue to use it. The few people that fly in for Warburg homecoming are still going to use it. I mean, yeah. five people a week use it. I mean, it's just to me, it's a lot of. I can't justify taking someone's land for five flights a week or something. Yeah. I think we need to look, take a look at, I mean, the usage data that I've found, uh, I mean, there's very little, I was surprised how little use. So I wouldn't say, in the usage that I've seen, if we didn't have the airport, it would not impact us. Um, I, think it, I think it's fine. Um, I mean, talking about Schneider Milling, crop dusters are, are able to use this airport, obviously. They do a lot of crazy things. They can use this. So I don't think we're going to lose any revenue. Um, to Dan's question, uh, we're, we're subsidizing the airport. I know that we do that in small communities, but it's not like it's bringing us revenue. And, and, I, and I really I looked hard to try to find through the records of the people that were using it to find some patterns, and I couldn't. You know, if, you know it's not like um, you know, the, the businesses in town are benefiting from this airport. And if we expand it 400 feet, are we going to? And I surely don't want Learjets coming off that air off that airstrip. You so, won't, not with 400 yeah, feet or, or double engines. <laughs> I don't, but I don't. I mean, we we joke about it, um, but I don't want to see it. I mean, we we deal with crop dusters on our neighborhood already, and I'd like to see them stop. So, selfishly, I'm, I'm not enthused about crop dusters flying over our neighborhood when, and I know they're underneath the uh, the limit that they're supposed to be flying. So, we used to think it was neat when we moved there. I don't, I don't uh, anymore. So, um, and then <coughs> taking someone's home that uh, have lived there longer than, than the airport. I don't agree with that. that. That's just my personal opinion. But unfortunately, I've been looking at the data for a long time, so I'm probably biased. That way. Have we ever done any kind of study uh, of opportunity loss? Opportunity. Well, lost opportunity if we don't do anything. That was my question toward I, people I think that run that, it now. Yeah, that's just a, a couple of points. One, I, I can almost guarantee there are more than five, five flights a week out of there. Uh, two, the Schmitz house was built in 1977, and the airport was there well before that. And three, when aerial services came, they were promised by the mayor and the airport commission at that time that this extension would happen soon. And that was how long ago, Mike? 15 years. Okay, so we've been talking about it for 15 years. The problem is, is if, if um, you have some other towns like Independence who just built a 6,000 foot runway 
who have done a lot to uh, attract more aviation and have seen their aviation really grow. Uh, you have Waterloo that's trying everything they can to attract aviation, but they're not. And we're starting to get more people to come up here for their maintenance and even fuel because they find it easier in general aviation to use our <coughs> airport um, for those who are comfortable with the length. So really, it's a question then of once ASI's lease is gone, if the extension doesn't happen, then will they come back? Especially if they have to move for a recon project, which they will. Uh, move their base somewhere else and then come back. So will they? I don't know. But when you look at the um, latest DOT numbers, uh, the direct and induced um, economic benefit is probably around uh, $1.5 million. But if you just go away from that and you just look at uh, payrolls, sorry, let me find that, from an airport, annual payroll or on airport activities um, is right now 720,000. So that includes direct and indirect and induced payroll. So if you go just down to direct, then that's uh, about 437,000. So what do those numbers mean? I don't know, but they're just indicators and that's how they compare airports across the state through the DOT, through their, their aviation review. So I think that there's a lot of um, emotions around this project too. There's a lot of data, you can slice it a lot of different ways. But I think what we're talking about here is we're not talking about a major north-south runway. We're not talking about um, significant uh, changes to this that do bring in much larger jets and corporate aviation and all of that. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know that we're talking about much more than completing a project that we've already started that we're two thirds of the way through um, to finish. I mean, I see the main problem I see, well, too, is you bring up independence and they have 6,000-foot runway. We, we can never compete with independence. So they could steal anyone from us at any time because no matter what we do to this airport, we're never going to get over 3,400 feet or whatever it is, right. half the size. Right. So, I mean, is this just an effort in futility to get 400 extra feet that's not going to gain us any more business? and might lose it anyway because they're going to move to an airport that's twice the size, just a couple, like 45 minutes away. I mean, right. and we're... It's a fair question. I mean, is the, um, would the expansion benefit the city of Waverly or expand, or would the expansion benefit the fixed space operator? Well, I think both. If you have more land, especially land that you can rent out, that means more income and less offset from the general fund. If you have more people flying, that means that the fixed base operator does better and you can renegotiate future leases as far as what the city pays the FBO for their costs of operation. So the healthier your airport is, the more ways you have to diversify your income stream, the better, better the city is because you have to look at what is your direct cost versus the economic impact. It's the same thing we talk about at the golf course. What's the economic impact of the golf course versus the subsidy of the general fund or the pool? Bring that up with, with the argument of we subsidize the airport and not wanting to subsidize something. We already subsidized several things in this town, so and golf course is probably one of the bigger ones that we subsidize that nobody's talking about closing the golf course because we're subsidizing it. We, we're trying to find ways to better use the golf course, <coughs> draw more people in to u make use of it. I think this is a very similar thing. We're trying to do something that will draw more people in to use it, make it more cost effective to have. The big difference is, is we're not taking people's land to make the golf course more attractive. Golf, or, golf course actually impacts people too. People actually golf there. I mean, numbers, large numbers. Way larger numbers no. than people that use the airport. No. And then, but and we're again, not taking we, we, people's property to do anything to the golf course. We're buying easements on property. We're not forcing anybody out of their homes. And, and it's kind of you know the same thing. Maybe, maybe it was more a mistake of the city to allow the development of Victory Heights that close to the airport if that's the issue. It's not, you know, the airport's been there a long time. The other option really is, you say we're not talking about closing the airport. Really it is basically to a point of saying we're, we don't want the airport anymore. Let's turn it into a business park, which that's, also, I guess, a fair discussion at this point to say we're looking for, for land for a business park. Maybe that's a better option for Why it. Why would the FAA pay to repave an entire runway if they're going to close it? 
tomorrow. That doesn't make any sense. No one's talking about closing the airport. I would say for we safety, it's the maintenance part again. If we start taking on $400,000 dollars worth of salary to run the airport, we probably will turn to very quickly saying <coughs> we don't want to spend $400,000 additional budget money on personnel costs when we're... When the current operators... $400,000 of salary to run the airport. What that if was, just that was like a FAA economic thing. DOT economic study. It has nothing to do with the airport. Okay. Well, what, whatever, what is the cost of, you know, I don't know what the cost is for the fixed base operated because they pay the salaries for people out there now. So yeah. if we lose them, th we're going to have to take over that. And again, that's an increase. That's that. one person that sits out there, but yeah. <laughs> when did they one sign person, their lease 15 mechanic. years ago? We just renewed a five-year lease last year. I'm sorry, I miss, misspoke. Aerial Services has been there since, uh, I think they're into or completing their 11th year. How many leases have they re-signed to stay there? They just re-signed, you said? We just did that last year, a five-year lease last year, wasn't Mike? So they've re-signed the lease three times to stay at the airport without it being longer. Well, the first time they were enticed to come with the idea that the city would be extending the runway. That didn't occur. The second time they up and renewed. A year ago, we we're already a year into the acquisition process, which now sounds like it's wanting to come to a stop. So, you know, they've kind of had this carrot dangled out in front of them, and then they feel like they keep it getting yanked away from them. So... They keep resigning, though. Because they keep <laughs> having a carrot dangled in front of them. We probably How many times are you going to... Though. I would say there's a lot of people that wish this project never got started in the first place. So that's not my, it's not my problem that the care has been dangled because I haven't been the one voting, you know, I haven't only been on council for two years and I voted against starting this in the first place, but. Um, but it passed. It did. And, and started. And, and we're, we're going to close on, you know, $600,000 worth of property. Maybe we shouldn't close if we don't know that we're going to get that all done. We have a legal obligation to close on those transactions because it was approved to do it that way. And each time yeah. we so, brought it to the council, so, it's been yeah. approved. So f a long time ago, we talked yeah, we about talked the about question this was a long asked. Time ago, and I if said, this doesn't, no one approved uh, the uh, eminent domain from the beginning. The question was asked if this doesn't happen for one reason or another, what happens? And it was basically we get our money back. Right. And I said, don't come to me with needing two homes and telling me that we're going to lose out on a million dollars of homes that we bought because and then force me to vote to take the rest of the homes and I specifically said that well at some point you have to get authorization to proceed with a closing on a, on a transaction and which is what I did I brought this before this council and the council approved purchasing these properties so now it, you're it was until we by decided doing all of this you are forcing everyone here to either say the city is going to lose out on six hundred thousand dollars or we have to vote to have the government take people's land. We already approved purchasing the land at those at those prices. That's not the way that we discussed it, though. That's not the way we discussed it. I mean, I specifically said we are not going to follow through with those until we know we're getting it all, and don't come to us and then say. Except and I know that, you guys remember this. Except that it each one has come to the council individually for action and has been approved unanimously. Or an agreement to purchase, just like the McKenzie thing came to, as an agreement. No, that was a that was an option. This is a purchase agreement. This, Can this I was ask to buy. A clarifying question. Yes. With the ones that are due to be closed in the next day weeks, if we don't move forward on trying to acquire the outstanding properties, do we retroactively lose anything from the FAA? The FAA hasn't paid anything towards those no, the, purchases. No, they're yet. paying their 90% on the their ones 90%. we're closing. Right. Yes. So are we in jeopardy of them coming back to us and asking for reimbursement on that? If we don't get them all? If I am understanding what Wes is trying to suggest is that if this for some reason doesn't continue to get council support, we're on the hook to pay the FAA's 90% on the ones we have agreed to purchase. I do not think so. I don't believe that's Because you can, you can accumulate them over time. So if we were trying to 
do this over a period of time and we waited another year or two, we could do it that way. That was my understanding. Right. I just wanted it's, to clarify. It's not that. all or nothing with them. It's just they want to see, see that you're continuing to make an effort. Right. They will, no, they will approve paying the 90%. I, I never thought, I never said that they would not pay the 90%. Maybe just they will. Okay, because uh, it feels like the city is trying to kind of strong arm us into voting for this because, hey, we've already wrapped up all the money in this and now we're screwed if we don't it, go through it. was it. the direction in the beginning to go out and say, get as many as you can. And when you can't get any more, come back to us. Right. Where, that's what we have done people, yeah. by the majority of the council. But the understanding at that time was if, if for some reason we couldn't get these other properties, it was understood that, that we would not be in danger for those. I mean, if that, yeah. I mean, thank goodness the meetings are recorded if we have to have that conversation. Where, again, I think what staff wants to do here is make sure that you're making informed decisions. And in an effort to do that, can I tell you that if you stop the process on these other three, the FAA, I do not believe, will reimburse us for any of the expenses incurred to date because we have not followed through with the purchase. So the appraisal. On the three parcels on the that we won't parcels close on. That we won't close on. Right. So the environmental reviews, the appraisals, anything that has been incurred today will not be eligible for 90% FAA reimbursement because we did not actually follow through with the purchase. Now, I'm not trying to arm twist you or. So if we follow through with the purchases we already have but don't do these final three, we're okay. We've already so followed we through. Pay we will not get any federal reimbursement for any part of the appraisal or the environmental review or any cost incurred today. We will bear 100% of that cost. And then when we, if, if two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, if we start the process all over again, we're, we're going to re-incur those costs all over again. That's not really what I'm asking, but so the ones that we've already purchased, they're not gonna take that money away. As, as Bill said, they will, very oftentimes, they will have airports where they have a landowner that says, hey, are you interested in buying? And if it's in the safety zone, you can go ask. FAA can approve the purchase of just that one parcel. So they will allow you to acquire them incrementally, and I think that's what, what Bill was alluding to. Then to me, it makes sense. I, mean, I don't see the rush in this, so... We, we have 75% of the properties, like you said. We have three left. Um, Schmitz, I don't, seems like they don't want any part of it. So let it play out the way it does. Miller's, let it play out. And maybe five, 10 years from now, we have all the land. The one thing about Miller's that you should understand is that if they build a new house, we're gonna it's gonna, we're gonna have to spend a lot more money to buy them out the next time. Um, right now, they don't have a house on that property, which means we don't have to pay for the house that's, that would be, then be built. And actually, the, the trees and the things in the, in, on the Miller property are actually in the safety hazard zone at the end of the runway. There are some areas there that there are tree, growing trees in that area, which is one of the concerns I think they had with um, that area isn't protected at this point. The Miller's at the front, you mean? The Miller's up on the yeah. top, yeah. So that, I mean, that is a situation, I think, that pro shows a hazard there because of the trees continue to grow. It, it interferes with the uh, landing area from that side or the, or the taking off area. Um, so th those are pretty critical. I mean, the ones on the north side are less critical probably if you're looking at it from a safety perspective. Right. But those are also more minimal takings. Um, the Burkles is just, you know, protecting that strip in between their buildings and the, and the runway, and Schmitz is pretty much the same way, but pre preventing them from adding on to any height to their buildings or allowing trees to grow in those areas that are in the blue. How many trees are they losing? 50 or 60. 51 out of 50. It's crazy to have them lose 60. It, I mean, a lot of those you wouldn't consider, I mean, they're trees that have just grown up relatively wild, I think, some in some respects, but there's some probably some good ones. In fact, they're listed. They actually had to go out and inventory every tree to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And so... And that's height. 
Um, just from a procedural perspective, I guess, to help me here, uh, if I'm understanding it correctly, based on council direction, you've, we've gone through the appraisal process, we've gone through the process of sharing information with all the property owners. We now have three property owners that you have not been able to negotiate a settlement with. So to continue, the next step would be to bring a resolution to the council asking us to give you the authority to proceed through the acquisition process. The eminent domain process. And actually, it's a, it's a valuation process. And it allows you to use your eminent domain to, to then acquire and that sets the value through the court system. So it seems like that needs to take place regardless of what the outcome of the vote on that resolution is. Not Let's just vote for that though, it's over. You Pardon? vote if you vote for eminent domain, it's over. The government will take their land at whatever price is deemed. I've been at all the meetings, I fully understand okay. that. Okay. Well that's but not I'm just saying not quite the way you're stating it. It is. Okay. We're giving them permission to continue the process that the majority of the council agreed to a year ago. To go out and try to acquire these through negotiation. Part of that was if that didn't work, they would come back and ask us for approval to take this step. There are certainly valid opinions on both sides of where you would vote on that, but to finish the process that was started, I think we owe it to ourselves as well as the community to have that resolution brought to the table and voted on. If it passes, it passes. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I guess I had a completely different interpretation of the process. I was more with Dave where the process was, let's see what we can get, and then it'll come to council and council decides if the government's going to take their land. And that's done through a resolution. But it's not, it wasn't a guaranteed. It was never guaranteed that council was going to vote. I never said it was. I said well, you kind of worded it that way. No, I said the council would have the opportunity and is what I meant. And even if we vote for eminent domain, it doesn't mean it, they can't still come to an agreement with us prior to it. Correct. Because, for example, the, the Miller property, they're asking about use of some of the buildings or the well or some of those things that were negotiated in there. <coughs> negotiating on if it goes to eminent domain they lose that option it just goes to a straight price for the the parcel but they could come to an agreement on a price before it goes to the actual hearing process on that which would, could include some of those additionals negotiated into you're just strong arming them into having to negotiate I mean you're either saying negotiate or you're screwed with whatever price that you government decides to take it at but I, I think we've discussed this enough so I don't really know why we discussed it anymore but make a decision if we decide we can't make a decision tonight on anything so. no I mean when it comes down to it and, and you know you're saying it's strong arming some people are saying it's making a decision to move forward with a project that's been you're not giving them a choice. Once you vote for eminent domain, you're no longer giving those people a choice. Their house, their land, their property will be taken from them by the government. Well aware of no if, ands, or buts about it. Okay. Have you address the council, please? You may we speak. We talked about uh, we were talking about the Miller property and the trees. If you drive out there, you notice that the trees have been topped at the level that meets the the bowl shaped vertical height restrictions that surround the center line of the runway and extend on either end of the runway. So it's not because you'd have to take all the trees out of the Miller property. They're already topping the, the trees off at a certain height. The question was asked about opportunities lost um, with the airport. Uh, when Weaver Light and Power bought uh, a 70 or 80 acre farm to put the two windmills on and they didn't get them on there fast enough because the center line of the airport runway lined directly up with where they were going to plant those two windmills. So there was an opportunity lost for Wave Light and Power to put two more windmills on land that they already owned because of the airport being where it's at. Also because of the, of the bowl-shaped height restrictions that are on each end of that runway and the lay of the land that goes uphill as it goes around the corner to um, 
uh, the Avenue of the Saints, uh, you cannot build anything on that interchange because vertically it would fall into that height restriction from the airport. So the airport is going to stop any development on the interchange of, I don't know what the number is, but it's the one that's directly west of the airport. Um, so when you talk about opportunities lost, you've, you've got an opportunity lost on four corners of an of a interchange coming into Waverly that w will never be developed as long as that airport's there. And we lost the two windmill locations to generate green energy for Waverly because of the airport. And when we talk about, uh, Dave's talked about looking at uh, uh, Monte usage, uh, a touch and go where a plane touches down, then rises, in, in a, like a student being taught how to uh, fly, that is counted as each time it touches down is, is one touchdown. Every time it rises is one takeoff. So those numbers are even smaller than once they appear. Thank you. Any more discussion? I don't think this should come to us, but it's not obviously my, not my decision. So. <laughs> no, we here. That's why we're here to hear your any last other comments. David, do you want to say any last comment? Okay. Dan Lampy, do you want? You know the <clears throat> the ten percent that we're paying is coming out of a TIF fund. You said, mm -hmm. and I think is that really best use of that money? I mean, that TIF funding, the uh, way I understand it, is for is for per future tax revenue. You know, if we own this land, not only are we taking land out of the out of the uh, assessment, you know, we're taking taxable land out of the county, we're also spending money that really has no hope of getting any money back as far as TIF funding. So I, I don't know if it's necessarily the best use of TIF funding, my, my point. Good argument. Yeah. It's not going toward downtown redevelopment. It's not going to... So we're, we're actually reducing revenue by buying this land. Any other reactions? I, mean, I know there's, it's, it's an ongoing thing because airports uh, generate growth of towns and it does it in a multiple different ways and it retains uh, business, commercial, it can go on, that whole side of life needs to be lifted up as well. And then you have the other sides and we all have to listen to each other and, and, and balance it. We go from not wanting the airport to wanting the airport, but putting practicality on how we go about what we do. So we have a very uh, tough, uh, but we're called to lead on this and we will continue to lead and we're in the middle of a process and it will keep moving forward. And uh, we'll just Thank see where wisdom takes us. Everyone needs to take an honest look at what Waverly's airport is. And it is pretty much a recreational small town airport that has no way of growing because it's landlocked by a railroad and a highway and independence already has one twice our length and we're never going to be able to compete with that so it can be exactly what it is today and it's going to have a beautiful brand new runway on it at the end of the summer and it'll still bring people in just like it is today so yeah we don't have to take land to do it and i thank everyone for listening to everyone because uh, all these points of view are valid thought through and have accumulated with we have to offer. Um, end of hearing on the airport. We come to reports from boards and commissions. We have received the Economic Development Commission minutes from February 10th. And thank you for those. Any comments on them? Then they're officially received. Staff comments. Uh, Phil, do you want to bring us to up to date on our communication from Intercog and then the Chamber? Yeah, the first is just a letter from Intercog um, just congratulating the City on its approval for the Hazard Mitigation Plan Amendment. This tied us in with uh, Bremer County and gives us about another three years before we do our next multi-jurisdictional plan 
under the county, which is the way they're moving to regionalize these plans. So Intercog will uh, close everything out for us with that. And then the next thing is a letter that we received from the chamber, just uh, highlighting different um, sponsorships available. Uh, obviously, we give them our annual contribution, and uh, this is more of a list of our their other events and other ways to contribute. I believe we also contribute with help with the downtown lighting and uh, re or two, don't we, Carla? Yeah. So just kind of outlines there. Uh, also outlining their efforts to drive more membership in the community. Uh, also, just a quick comment, like I said, uh, two, two comments. Uh, Mike and I are reviewing the Green Bridge study, or the, all of our bridge assessments, and we'll get that out to you with photos. Uh, and then um, hopefully by the March 2nd meeting have a plan as far as how we want to get input and, and look at our options going forward, uh, have some community discussions about the next step on the bridge. And uh, also on the March 2nd meeting, a resolution uh, authorizing the funding for the area veterans post. They would like to have some sort of official green light on the funding. As you know, we put it in the budget, but we talked about having an official resolution approving it. They would then like to take that if it's approved at whatever level to use to leverage for other funding. So that's why they're asking for kind of a quick turnaround on that. So we'll put, um, we're going to put a draft resolution that authorizes the $50,000 and knowing that it can be amended at the meeting or based on the discussion. What's the timing on that since the budget is for starting July 1st? Are we able to move that up earlier for them? You could do an earlier start date. What they really want is just basically uh, our equivalent of a pledge or an official um, resolution or letter from the city saying that this is the amount they're going to get because then they'll take that and, and use that or additional fundraising. And the 100 from this year we've already taken care of? We've already taken care of that. So you, you can still, and I think it would be fine with them to still receive the $50,000 after July 1, but uh, because of their spring efforts, they would like that some sort of official understanding of where they stand. Okay. Thank you. Any other staff comments? Thank you. Let's do council comments and the Dan Dan David side. Nothing to Nothing. Uh, Nothing. Whoa. No, I'm good. I'm fine too, thanks. Our last hope is uh, uh, Councilman Gade. Uh, since you brought up the downtown lights, um, this, uh, was, it's just popped in my head, but uh, since all the new LED lights went all around town, they're nice and white, and our, which I do love, our downtown lights are the traditional lamppost kind of they're really yellow. Is there a way to make those lights a little brighter and whiter to do more, but still have that traditional look that we have? They are changing out those heads as they go. And I think you'll notice, I have to remember, I was looking in my rearview mirror the other night when I was on Bremer, and I think I was going east. I think you'll notice west of the river, they've been switched over to LEDs, so they're the clean white. Okay. And east of the river, they're still the high-pressure sodium, so they're the orange. And so they'll con that's kind of their last... Um, as I understand it, that's their something. last switch over is those because they had to wait for those light heads to come down in price, essentially, so it was cost effective. That makes sense. Okay. But that's that's the final phase of switch out. So everything will be that clean white. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. It looks nice. Yes. I like that we keep the downtown looking like that. It's very cool. Yeah. And the historic lamp post, I think, add yep. a lot. Yep. Jeff Bick. I'd like to thank Wes for uh, asking me to be on uh, up here for the month of February, and thank you for uh, allowing me to come here. Uh, plenty of times I felt like I'd like to voice my vote too, but uh, <laughs> because of this experience, I'll uh, go to my ward councilman and maybe uh, keep in touch with him a little bit more. So appreciate it. Well, thank you. It's good to have you, and um, this was. Uh, my comment is that this was a important meeting tonight and uh, that we truly um, can do, do discourse at this level is so important and it's affirming to the city. Everybody's comments were articulate and uh, to the point, even if we couldn't figure out the best way to go or be convinced 
or know where the majority will lie, but that will be in a future meeting. So thank you for tonight. Is there a motion to adjourn? We adjourn. Is there a second? All in favor signify with yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs>